Hi, and welcome to this installment of our industry leadership series. I'm Brian Dobson, Head of Stack and Disruptive Technology Equity Research at Chardin Capital Markets. As always, I'll start the call on a semi-interesting note with some important disclosures. During this call, we will not be discussing Chardian research. <clears throat> Any discussions about research should be coordinated between a participant and their respective salesperson. Our compliance team has asked me to read the following statement for the investor call. By participating in this call, our speakers attest that they have made Chardian aware of any potential conflicts, and they will not discuss any material non-public or potential information that they are aware of that may breach their legal, regulatory, or fiduciary responsibility to any parties. So with those disclosures out of the way, it's my pleasure to introduce Dennis Porter, CEO and co-founder of the Satoshi Action so exploring Bitcoin mining facilities in Georgia. And I believe that his perspective on the sector is valuable, and I look forward to uh, exploring it with all of you today. Dennis, thank you so much for joining us this morning. Brian, happy to be here. Thank you for having me on the call, and it was great meeting you at the Clean Spark facility in Norcross, Georgia, and we uh, got to go to the College Park one as well, too, so appreciate you and looking forward to this conversation. Yeah, like uh, so let's kick it off with a big picture question. As you're looking at the global landscape, what do you identify as the key global mega trends that could shape Bitcoin over the next few years? I think the mega trend in the Bitcoin mining space is going to be energy companies coming in and starting to either buy Bitcoin mining companies or mine directly themselves or have some sort of a third party relationship. And we can already see this beginning to take place and take hold. We've seen Shell and Exxon make decisive movements into the Bitcoin mining space. Exxon is using or testing Bitcoin mining for the purposes of reducing emissions from oil and gas operations. Shell also moving into the space. They're providing liquids. In fact, one of the liquids that was used for the immersion cooling in the CleanSpark facility was a, 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 was a liquid that was created by Shell themselves as a mineral oil. Uh, and so it's really incredible to see these companies moving into the space. And on top of uh, the effort by Shell to get involved with the immersion cooling liquids, we also see them now sponsoring the largest Bitcoin conference in the world, which will be later this year in, in 2023. So the energy companies are seeing what's going on. They're seeing the potential of this space. And over the next decade, I think that Bitcoin and Bitcoin mining will be characterized by the move of energy companies, utility companies, power companies, Anybody that is touching electricity, anybody that's touching touching energy is going to be mining Bitcoin over the next decade. Yeah, you know, I think that we agree with that viewpoint. And I suppose within that, how do you expect the industry to evolve to become a better partner with energy over the coming years? So over the coming years, in order for Bitcoin and Bitcoin mining to coordinate well with energy companies, I think we're going to need to see either at least a hands-off approach or a lot more engagement on the political front in order to ensure that we can move the right direction with Bitcoin and Bitcoin mining. That's why I set up the Toshi Action Fund. It's a critical component to making sure that the United States can be a leader on Bitcoin mining because being a leader on Bitcoin mining will allow us to continue to lead on on energy. And so if we can shape the policy landscape, the regulatory landscape in a way that understands the benefits of this technology, right? Because there are so many critical benefits that this technology, Bitcoin mining, also we refer to it as proof of work, has to offer. Uh, you know, at Satoshi Action Fund, we say those five key benefits are that it can provide high paying jobs, local investment, grid stability, environmental cleanup, and then it can also help enhance green and renewable energy projects. And we want policymakers and regulators to understand that, the public as well, but policymakers and regulators over the next decade are gonna be crafting policy and regulation that'll either aid this industry or hurt this industry. And we can either lead on Bitcoin mining the way we did with the internet and build it at a totally brand new economy in the United States, or we can fall behind very much like China did and decide to ban or over-regulate this industry. And the, the interesting thing about Bitcoin mining is that it can really go anywhere. It's, it doesn't care where it, it sets up shop. In fact, it often at times is drawn not only to areas with cheap power, which the United States has plenty of, but also to areas where they feel like they're gonna have some sort of political protections. 
And that's again, why I created my organization because I saw the critical need to make sure that we shape the story, shape the policy and shape the regulation in this country to attract Bitcoin mining and to be able to have all those benefits that I mentioned earlier take place here in America. You know, I think you touched on it a little bit in that answer, but what do you think of the key misconceptions about the mining industry? Yeah, the, the, the key misconception really is almost always having to do with energy, right? I think it's, 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 it makes sense why, though. We're all taught from a very early age that we need to reduce our consumption in order to have a positive impact on the planet, that we should be being, being careful about our resources. So when you hear some news story saying, you know, Bitcoin miners are using more energy than some small nations, like it, it very quickly triggers this feeling or this thought in your head that Bitcoin mining is doing something bad. And the truth couldn't be more opposite from that, which is being displayed to us today in the public sphere, in the media, or by policymakers. Bitcoin mining has the potential to advance our electrical infrastructure by performing demand and frequency response, which are critical components for renewables to increase their penetration onto the grid. I know renewables are great, you know, they have the, the great component of reducing our emissions, but every energy, every type of energy generation has its upside and it has its downside. With coal, with natural gas, it's very cheap, it's very abundant, and it can perform baseload energy. But again, we're going back to this conversation about it being a dead end and we need to move towards cleaner and more renewable energy generation. So th that's the downside of coal and natural gas, right? Is that it produces emissions. Uh, but the, the upside to renewables is the opposite of that, right? They are able to reduce the emissions that we create. However, what is the downside of renewables? The huge downside of renewable energy generation is that it is a very intermittent energy source, which means that it doesn't create energy whenever we want it to. It only creates energy when the wind is blowing and when the sun is shining. Well, that creates quite a lot of problems for grid operators who in the past have had very reliable energy, uh, baseload energy from thermal turbines and also obviously hydro can be relatively uh, dependable as well. And a thermal turbine really is anything that, uh, thermal turbine generation, I should say, is anything that heats up water, turns it into steam, and then uses that to spin a turbine really, really fast to create or generate electricity. Well, these thermal turbines have been really, really good for also stabilizing the grid. Uh, in fact, they're, they've miraculously been able to, over the last several decades, to make sure that we have um, pr primary frequency response that, that is performed almost automatically. But with renewables, some of the problems that are around renewables are very much around the ability to stabilize the grid. So. Renewables, again, going back to the fact that they only create energy when the wind is blowing, sun is shining. Well, grid operators need to know what's going to happen next. And if they can't plan on renewables being there, it creates a lot of instability. And a lot of the instability is around frequency. So fre real quickly, frequency is the measurement of the grid, the, uh, the stabilization of the grid. And if the number changes much at all, it doesn't need to change a lot. It can cause a lot of serious problems. And in fact, if, if we just stand by and, and do nothing, and we just watch as the frequency drops or goes up, the grid itself will, will fry. And that's a really, you know, obviously a very, very big problem. And in areas where, you know, you have a lot of grid instability, you'll oftentimes see grid operators perform rolling brownouts, rolling blackouts in order to ensure that we don't go to a situation where we have a grid that's fried. Also, also code a black start or system-wide outage. And these are really, really bad. They very rarely happen because grid operators are willing to do whatever it takes to stop this from happening. Uh, and so renewables, they because of the instability or the, the inability to depend on them for baseload generation, we have to find customers or someone, maybe whether it be customers, whether it be other power production to fill in the gaps. In the past with renewables, wind and solar, we've built a lot of gas peaker plants, which is kind of counterproductive to the effort to decarbonize the grid. If we're, every time we're building renewables, we're also following suit by building peaker plants, which run on idle, literally run on idle. So it's called a spinning reserve, right? And they just sit there and they wait for renewables to have any sort of problems. And they wait for any sort of uh, deviations in frequency. They wait for any sort of uh, excess demand to come onto the grid to be able to supply uh, and, and take care of that excess demand. So it's, it's like, okay, how do we solve this problem? Well, in the, 
in the past, it's been, again, electrical infrastructure, building peaker plants, potentially batteries as a solution, but they haven't, batteries really haven't come and saved the day quite yet. Maybe they will in the future, and I assume that we will continue to follow down that path. But aside from supply side response, one of the things that we can do is have demand side response. So this is called demand response. It's a very popular program that has been being built for you know, 10, 20 years. And it really does help potentially solve some of these problems. But it, not very many people are willing to participate in these programs, demand response. And it's a little, it's younger cousin I'd call frequency response. I'll get into that, you know, kind of how that works in a moment. But but in order for customers to participate in demand response, they have to be just basically willing to shut down all of their energy usage in the middle of the day. And I don't know about you, but most people are not really willing to shut down their energy consumption in the middle of the day, especially during you know, winter storms, when it's hot outside, most people are gonna have their AC on, they're gonna have their heating on during those times. And that's when we really see that start to see these peaks. So what do we do? How do we solve this problem? Well, this is where Bitcoin mining comes in. Because Bitcoin mining is location agnostic and it can turn on and off whenever needed, with literally at the flip of a switch, there in fact, there are whole companies being developed like Lancium in order to solve this problem, to create software to help control Bitcoin mining and make the increase and decrease in its consumption very programmatic. So Bitcoin miners come in, programmatic software, whenever the grid is going up and we're starting to see a lot of demand, we can go to these Bitcoin miners and say, hey, you know what, will you just curtail your usage for a little while while we're going through this peak period so that we can provide, you know, make sure we provide electricity to everybody else. And the reason why Bitcoin miners will say yes to that is because FERC, which is the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission, has mandated that anybody that participates in demand or frequency response must be justly compensated. And so miners will actually get paid to curtail their usage. This is a really, really critical thing and it's really important and in fact, the IEA says that we need 500 gigawatts of customers that are willing to participate in demand response. Well, where are we gonna get all that demand response from? Well, again, going back to Bitcoin mining, I think Bitcoin mining is the perfect solution for demand response. So when people talk about Bitcoin using too much energy, I don't think it uses enough energy. We need incredible amounts of demand response uh, capacity to be able to service the needs of a decarbonized grid. I'll get into frequency response probably a little bit more in the conversation, but I'll, I'll pause there and kind of see some, see if you have any back and forth on that. Yeah, no, that's, that, that's incredible because I think that Bitcoin's ability to help to stabilize is, is very even overlooked by environmental factions or, or government regulators. Um, do, do you want to delve a little bit more into, into that? Absolutely happy to cover, you know, I, I, there's the demand response component and that really does help us kind of give a forward looking like, hey, you know, grid operators will go to Bitcoin miners. They'll say 30 to 60 minutes from now, we might need you to curtail your usage. Okay, fine. We'll do that. You, you're going to pay us for it. That's fine. Well, we're happy to participate in that program. And the other part of all of this stabilization conversation is frequency response. And so going back to that number, we're at 60 Hertz in the United States, 50 Hertz in Europe. And we have to maintain a very close, tight, narrow number on that. I think in ERCOT, which is Texas's grid, the number is like 59.85. Like once they start to see anything drop below that, that's when they start to say, okay, who's gonna help us bring this number back up? And in the past, it's been peaker plants, spinning reserves, sitting there waiting, like, okay, uh, we see some sort of deviation in frequency. Let's plug some power into the grid and help solve this problem. Well, on come along Bitcoin mining, and now all of a sudden we have a load as a resource to solve this problem. And in, and there really hasn't been very many customers that can participate in frequency response because the difference between demand response and frequency response is that frequency must happen very, very, very quickly. It's an it's almost an instantaneous thing. As I mentioned thermal turbines do this almost automatically uh, through the governors that they have on their systems. As power increases or decreases, there will, that will increase or decrease uh, uh, the steam that goes through a valve in order to help kind of keep those, uh, those turbines spinning. And again, that's all automatic. But if with you have renewables on the grid, there's no automatic process for frequency response. So if you have some sort of deviation, you do need someone that will respond. And Bitcoin mining can come in and be that customer that can help respond. And, and in all that process, 
one of the really important things to remember is that, you know, if you're if you're having a, a you know generation respond to this, so whether that be a peaker plant, whether that be any other spinning reserves that could be from gas plants or coal or you name it, right? When they're responding, it's a, it costs money to the grid, right? Like that's they're having to spend a lot of extra money in order to get that response, and 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 you're increasing emissions. But if you have Bitcoin miners doing it, that you don't need all of that extra infrastructure. You don't need spinning reserves that are coming from carbon producing generation. So all, automatically, Bitcoin is now having a carbon negative impact on frequency response systems, which I think is a really critical component to bring into the conversation that you can actually accomplish this, reduce emissions, and it's a business that is getting paid to do these responses. And it's not infrastructure. It's someone that's already making money and saying, hey, we're behinding Bitcoin. Oh, but you need us to curtail for just a, a few seconds. Boom, we're happy to curtail uh, and do that for the grid because they still, again, get paid for that service. But there's no sort of cost that goes into supporting that system other than just when you need it, you have it available to you. Um, so Bitcoin miners are gonna start performing frequency response. They're already doing demand response all across Texas. And I believe they'll be doing it all across the entire United States over the next decade. And as we build out these systems, we're going to need folks that are interested in investing and helping to develop this stuff, right? Because we're not quite there yet. There are companies, like I said, Lancium doing incredible cutting edge stuff. We need more companies to invest in this space so that we can have more frequency response customers who ultimately help us be able to build more renewables, reduce our emissions, and bring down costs to ratepayers because every time you re eliminate infrastructure for the purposes of stabilizing the grid, that makes keeping the grid stable cheaper and more affordable. So if the grid is cheaper and more affordable to support, that means ratepayers are paying less. So that means all the rates for all of us are going down across the country, which I think is a really important conversation to be having in the middle of an energy crisis that's taking place in Europe today. The, these problems are solvable. We can solve these problems. And Bitcoin mining, I think, will lead the way on solving and creating interesting and innovative solutions. Yeah, I, I agree with you there. Um, sh shifting gears a little bit, and, and let's talk about your outlook for, call it, federal regulation in the sector. How do you think that's going to evolve in broad terms? I know that you're active with many state legislatures, but where do you think regulation is heading? Well, if I have anything to do about it, it's it's heading uh, for a positive direction. That uh, yeah, that's that's the purpose of Satoshi Action is to help guide state policy on Bitcoin mining. So we have four pieces of our own policy. We're doing microgrid policy. Uh, we have uh, mining council policy, so people can essentially study Bitcoin mining at the state level. Um, we also have an orphaned oil well policy, which helps states to solve the problem that's created by orphaned oil wells. Which you know that's a whole different. Uh, conversation. And we also have a Mining Protection Act, right, which is very much just the different, you know, flying in the face of what's going on in New York. New York has decidedly said, you know, we want to try to limit this space. We want to limit this industry. And I think it really comes from a place of not understanding the potential of the technology. I don't think it has that they, they, they hate Bitcoin miners in particular. I think that, unfortunately, there's a misunderstanding of where this technology is headed and what it can do for their state. And I've said to, to folks in New York before, I said, you know, hey, you don't want to mine Bitcoin behind the meter with fossil fuel. That's great. You know, that's fine. If that's your values, then you should align with your values. People need to remember that Bitcoin mining is a tool and you can use that tool for good or for bad. Same thing with the internet, right? Like we all know that the internet can be used for good or for bad. Most of us decide to use it to order Uber. You know, we, we use it to get on a Zoom call or watch me and you ch chat on the internet, but it can also be used for things that we don't like. And the same thing is true about Bitcoin mining. You can use it to mine Bitcoin off of coal, or you can use it to mine Bitcoin off of renewable energy generation. And if your state is saying, we don't want to mine Bitcoin off of coal because we think that coal is going to cause problems for us in, uh, in, in the long term on the environmental side, fine. But also recognize the benefits and encourage the growth of those benefits. So that's what we're doing at the state level, actively pushing the Mining Protection Act, which we're really excited about. There's a lot of states who have re reached out to us. We're having a lot of different conversations. Our, I mean, our policy already has been introduced in New Hampshire. We have other states poised and ready to introduce it as well. Uh, and that's on the state side. On the federal side, there's not a lot of movement. But if I had my way, like if I had my, my wish list, you know, we would go and we would talk to FERC. We would talk to the other RTOs and ISOs and we would say, listen, look at what's going on in Texas. 
look at all of the benefits that they are receiving from this technology in ERCOT. They are masterfully using it in order to attract new generation, in order to reduce rates there, in order to reduce the dependency on peaker plants and other types of supply side response to be able to bring down rates again for their customers. So it's, we're lucky really in a sense that, that ERCOT sits outside of FERC. FERC is you know, the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission and they oversee a lot of things, but one of the things that they oversee is the seven RTOs and ISOs in this country. You know, we'll see if we can name them. We got New York and, and New England ISOs. Those are two right there. We've got MISO, we've got PJM, we've got KISO, uh, we've got MISO, and then we've Southwest Power Pool and then ERCOT, right? And so all of these guys are working to help improve the transmission operation within their region. Sometimes they're in a single state, you know, like ERCOT, KISO, which is California, and New York, which is New York ISO. Those are all kind of like in one state, but oftentimes these things are much bigger and cover vast regions. The, the one great thing though, is that uh, ERCOT sits outside of FERC. It's the only RTO ISO, which is just for those of you that are listening, an RTO is a regional transmission operator and ISO is independent system operators. ISOs were kind of the, the original birth of, of these systems. And then now we've moved on to RTOs, which are the newer version of, of an ISO, but they're really virtually you know, the, same, the same thing. So uh, what we wanna do on the federal side is we wanna say, okay, take a look at what's going on in ERCOT. Take a look at all the positive things that are happening. We go to FERC, we go to the other RTOs and ISOs and say, you should be taking all of the good because it's not all good. There's, you know, there, there's a sandbox. They're testing stuff out in, in ERCOT right now. But take the things that you see, they're obviously having a positive impact and direct them into your RTOs and ISOs so that we can start to advance our inf electrical infrastructure in a way that's beneficial to all of us. And that's all totally possible, but there will take a significant amount of work at the federal level. DOE needs to get involved. FERC needs to get involved, which is a, a, you know, an independent office within, within the DOE. And they need to start influencing these RTOs and ISOs to lead on this issue and to follow, you know, follow the footsteps of what's going on in Texas. We're very fortunate to have Texas. Um, we're, we work really closely with the Texas Blockchain Council down there and doing a lot of work to help, you know, guide the guide. And we, we co-branded a one pager together. We might be able to work on some policy together and very excited about what's going on there because now other states are seeing it, not even just on the federal side, which is important conversation. Other states like Ohio. Ohio is really starting to see what's going on. And there are some very big innovators in Ohio that want to push them to the forefront of everything that's going on. Because Ohio is an interconnecting point for a lot of energy in this country and a significant amount of manufacturing. It's like a quarter of the size of Texas and California, but it's the third largest manufacturing state in the country. So they see the potential of reducing rates just for that industry alone. You can bring down electrical costs for manufacturing then you can start talking about not only creating jobs and improving the economy of Ohio and Texas and California and all these other RTOs and ISOs, but all of a sudden now you're talking about repatriating manufacturing because if your energy costs are cheap enough, you can make up for the cheap labor potential of being outside the United States. And also, obviously, as we, work, as we move through this very uh, unstable time, I think a lot of folks are going to be looking, a lot of industry folks are going to be looking at the United States and saying, hey, not, not looking so bad. Maybe I'm paying a little bit more on labor costs, uh, but not looking so bad with the political instability that's occurring across the planet and the supply chain issues that are occurring. So hopefully we can use those influences, also Bitcoin mining, to be able to drop rates down and repatriate as much of our manufacturing as possible back to the United States, where we will see a massive economic boom in this country. You know, you provide a lot of really interesting commentary there about providing uh, greater flexibility to the grid. Um, as you're thinking about Bitcoin as a catalyst for green energy investment and green energy products, I guess how do you see that panning out over the next year or two? And and what kind of projects can we see these these miners? Right. I mean, it's it's kind of a no brainer. It's really to co-locate Bitcoin mining with en green energy projects. You know, as we highlighted, they're really good for stabilizing the grid. But and one of the things that I, th I think I mentioned when I was when I was going through all that stabilization factor is the ability to monetize excess generation. If you go right now to 
California ISO's homepage or one, it's maybe it's a sub page on there. They monitor and track all of the curtailment that it's occurring in that state on, on that uh, ISO. And the level of curtailment that is taking place in California is incredible. I mean, this chart is going parabolic because the more renewables that you create, particularly the more solar that you create, the more curtailment that will take place. And curtailment really is just like, you know, it's, it's kind of self-explanatory word, but to put it into a longer definition, it is when you have solar, potential solar power that you could be generating, that could be being plugged into the grid, but isn't because there either is no demand or there's some sort of transmission bottleneck and they can't, they you know really just can't get the electricity to any customers. So curtailment is a really big problem in anywhere that has high renewable penetration, but particularly solar. And the reason why is because solar tends to create the most amount of power or do doesn't tend to, it definitely creates the most amount of power in the middle of the day when the sun you know, is, is highest in the sky. Unfortunately, when solar is creating a lot of energy, when the sun is highest in the sky, also happens to be when there's the least amount of demand on the grid because folks are at their workplace and they're not at home. And one of the biggest generation, excuse me, one of the biggest customers for energy in the United States is in individual home, residential homes. When they heat, cool, when they're using their electronic devices, there's a significant increase in demand on the grid because of these activities. So we're all at work, we're, we're all doing our thing and sun is high in the sky and solar is creating a lot of electricity and there's no one there to buy it. Well, Bitcoin mining can come in and it can buy up all of that excess generation. It can monetize it, which means there's two things that will occur. One, renewable energy projects will increase their ROI, which means that they will be easier to build. They will be able to uh, make funding attracted to the space a lot quicker, right? Because all of a sudden now you have this customer that's location agnostic, can go anywhere, can plug in. The only real gap to this, the only real gap to this problem is again, regulatory policy. Unfortunately in this country, uh, you know, fortunately or unfortunately, for, fortunately for the, the growth of the electrical infrastructure, we've had to have the regulations in place that we have, right? We've had to have vertically integrated let utilities in order to make sure we don't have wires going everywhere, right? We just have one power company, one set of wires, and there's the customer. Um, you know, we're changing that model as we go on. RTOs and ISOs are a form of deregulation to be able to help increase uh, transmission, reduce bottlenecks, and make rates cheaper for customers. But it's still not enough to be able to take advantage of the technology, which is Bitcoin mining. So what you'd want to do is theoretically is you'd want to take your Bitcoin mining operation and you would wanna put it right next to the wind and solar to help reduce those bottlenecks, monetize all of that excess energy generation. Unfortunately, you can't just do that. You can't just go put Bitcoin miners wherever you want and buy energy from those wind and solar farms. The reason being is that utilities have service territories and oftentimes wind and solar generation sits outside of the service territory of the, of the utility that owns that asset. And so if you say, okay, here's my service territory, here's my wind and solar, and I'm using high transmission voltage lines to supply energy to that customer, that's a great idea, right? Unfortunately for the systems that we have today, we've been building a lot of wind and solar before we've been building the transmission lines. And so you have a significant amount of stranded wind and solar all across the planet. And so what you would wanna do is shape regulation in a way that can help us go in and be able to monetize that excess generation. It would look something like a sleeved PPA and sleeved PPA is kind of essentially say, hey, we recognize that you're the local utility that you have control over this territory. Uh, why don't we pay you a small fee to be able to use uh, these wind and solar assets outside of our service territory? Unfortunately, the fee right now is not small to be a, to do a sleeve PPA or some sort of agreement with the local power company or local utility. So what we need to do is create a situation where it's a win-win-win for everybody. And typically in the Bitcoin mining space, you can do that. So we're always looking for ways to make it a win-win-win for all the folks involved. So uh, going back to the solar component though, real quickly, you can monetize all that excess generation, which is really, really helping to improve the economics for solar. But you can also, again, wind down the moment that people are coming back on and they need to be able to go, go in and use any of the energy that's being created by, by wind and solar. So uh, in my opinion, wind and solar will benefit the most from Bitcoin mining out of any type of energy generation. I think you can't deny that anybody can t technically use Bitcoin mining to monetize their excess generation. 
But the difference between wind and solar and everything else is because we can't decide when they're on and when they're off. That's why Bitcoin mining is so important because there will just be generation that we can't use. Whereas with coal and that gas, we can just reduce the amount of fuel that's being put in. We can, we can say, oh, there's nobody using it. Oh, we'll shut it down. So that's a huge, that's a huge boost. Um, there's a lot of other positives that Bitcoin mining can do to help with load cycling as well. Um, I'll, I'll pause though, because that, that jumps away from the renewable conversation and see if there's an, a, a, you know, a little bit of time to go back to it later. Well, you could explore it a little bit now, but you are heading for the, the end of our time. And I was wondering, as you're thinking about the next 12 to 24 months, think something. I didn't quite hear you there. It was a cutting out a little bit. Did you, could you try and repeat yeah, that question real quick? I apologize for my, for my hardware problems. Um, you know, over the next 12 to 24 months, what are the side things that lay ahead of the it sounded like you said that what what are some you know twelve to twenty four months what are the exciting things that lay ahead you know for for Bitcoin mining it really is going to be the the adoption by energy companies because it just makes sense to adopt Bitcoin mining if you're an energy company you have problems that Bitcoin mining can solve Bitcoin mining can solve excess generation problems it can solve demand and frequency response problems that are needed for renewables. And it can also solve some of the load cycling issues. And it can make it can make things like nuclear energy, which is really a baseload energy that can't deploy um, like a demand response program or frequency or load response program because it kind of maintains itself at the same number all the time. Uh, it's, 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 it's output, right? Well, now because of Bitcoin mining, what you could do is you can co-locate next to that facility and you can have your nuclear up at 100% uptime all the time putting out excess generation because almost every every power generation site is required to keep some amount of their potential energy generation in reserve for the grid. Well, instead of doing that, you have Bitcoin miners next to it, monetizing all the potential of nuclear, returning more ROI, which is really needed because as we move towards SMRs, we are going to need more incentive to build these, this power generation out because SMRs are going to be a critical component to the transition to decarbonize the grid. They're one of the most important components of technology that Bitcoin mining could help unlock. But now because you're up at 100% uptime, what do you do? You know, you, it's hard to wind up and down, it's slow. Well, that's where you have Bitcoin mining come in and it can operate as a load balancer for nuclear or any other type of energy generation, which helps not only to monetize excess generation, it also reduces wear and tear on those turbines. So thermal turbines, they don't like to be cycled up and down. They were never meant to do that. The only reason we do is because of the instability on the grid, which is part and part increasing because of the renewable energy generation that we've been creating. So it's like somehow Bitcoin mining comes in and is a perfect partner for every single type of generation. And what states and governments need to do is decide where do you want to direct Bitcoin mining? Because it is a tool that we have in our hands and we can decide to use it for good or for bad. And I think that it's the most important thing that we can do at a state level and at the federal level is not try to get in the way of Bitcoin mining, but we should try to advance it and incentivize it as much as possible to pursue the areas that we see valuable, whether that be renewables, whether that be decarbonizing the grid, whether that be electrifying our economy, Bitcoin mining has the potential to help with all of those things and also help transition us at the same time. At the same time. Well, we certainly agree with your point of view. Um, we're very excited about several of the Bitcoin miners that we have under coverage, and we look forward to having you back to discuss this further in the future. It's been a wonderful use of time. I think it's been enlightening for our investors, and uh, thank you very much for, for spending the time here with us today. Of course, and uh, we didn't even get a chat about how Bitcoin mining can reduce emissions from landfills and help to uh, reduce methane emissions, so I'm sure I'll be back and happy to talk about that in the future. Happy to talk about that in the future. Yes, wonderful.